I just want each of you to consider the show or the movie that you just mentioned to your neighbor. Do you know who directed it? Who wrote it? Who produced it? Who financed it? Who distributed it? Here we are at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. So, and I am short, so I'm going to bang into the mic. Um, by definition, we are an international audience. But chances are, if we looked at each thing that each of you said, the vast majority of you, more than 80% of you, just named a television show or a movie that was directed, written, financed, distributed by a white American, white American men. White American men don't make up 80% of the global population. And so the fact that this population is overrepresented in our media, in our media meal, has a profound and detrimental impact on our health, all of our health, for all genders, as individuals and as a society. So if you're like me, you may pay more attention to the food you eat, read the ingredients, was it organic, where was it sourced, was it fair trade, than you do the media meal that you imbibe. But it turns out where our media is sourced is perhaps having a more profound effect on our societal health than even our food. Because media is food for our consciousness. It's not that we on this panel and at the UN don't want Caucasian American men to make movies that have their voice represented. But when that ingredient is overrepresented in the media meal, it's like baking a cake that has 80% salt. That doesn't work. It creates distortions in our perception and impact that can have ancillary consequences that sometimes create devastation in our society, including the creation of a culture that is conducive to sexual harassment and violence, which affects all genders. My name is Sheva Carr, and we are having computer issues today. <laughs> I am the co-vice president of United Nations Peace Messenger Organization, Pathways to Peace, and I am the founding president and CEO of Heart Ambassadors. And it was my incredible privilege to convene this panel today, inspired by the fact that at Pathways to Peace, we've identified that media and the arts are one of the eight critical pathways to creating a global culture of peace. At my first commission on the status of women, I learned that more women have died in gender-based violence than all the world's soldiers and all the world's wars combined. So peacemaking is not about ending war. We can't talk about a global culture of peace without addressing gender-based violence. And we cannot address gender-based violence without addressing gender inequities in our media. Because media is modeling gender-based violence. And without addressing gender equity in media, then media will not be able to take its rightful place as a genuine pathway to global peace. Today we are here to provide a gap analysis of gender equity in media, address the impact of the gap, and create a recipe for action to change the media meal. This social change will help us close the gap for the benefit of all humanity and all life on our planet, not just women. I start with some challenging news and some good news. I have to say that curating this panel for me was like being a dentist forced to pull good teeth. I had so many incredible, inspiring women who were ready to speak to the genius work they are doing in the field of closing gender equity gap in the media. And so um, we had to solve this problem because there are many women I wanted on this panel, but we didn't have the time in 90 minutes, and we won't have time for live Q&A with all of you. And so we decided, because this is about using media for the advancement and empowerment of women, to continue the conversation in virtual media. So um, 
There will be pads passed around for you to give us your email addresses, but we encourage you in real time, we have team members getting your emails now, to write to support at heartambassadors.com with your questions or contact for any of the panelists as they're speaking today. And if you'd like to be added to a mailing list to continue this conversation with us after today. So that's support at heartambassadors.com. Also, to save time, and it's going to be hard, I promise you, because I, if it were up to me, I would just sit here and applaud these women all day. I am in awe to stand next to them. Um, but we're going to ask you to hold your applause until the very end. And with that, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Tanya Pinkins, who is an award-winning, Tony Award-winning Broadway actress who is using her incredible voice as a director, an actress, a storyteller, to bring gender equity to media on the Time's Up Data Collection Committee. Tanya Pinkins. Yeah. If you can hear me, can you raise your hand? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. The one thing that I know to be true, we can jump, I don't know how to move things. Oh, she's doing it. She's got it. I got my, it's, it's, it's magical because this is what I know to be true, that we are stronger when we run with our pack. And not just any pack, but our pack. So are you willing to be my pack for the next six to eight minutes? Oh, yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. So sound, music, that is a universal language. So I'm going to ask you to make some sound with me right now. You're going to listen with me, and then when you feel that you know what the next sound is, you're going to join in with me. Are you willing to do that with me, yes or yes? Yes. Okay. Yana ho e ya ho e ne. Yana ho e ya ho e ne. that means birth like a she-bear. So some of us found our voices when we were making that sound and we used our voices and many of us were not able to use our voices. Many of us cannot use our voices. And this is a day when technology can actually erase us from the narrative. So um, this is a picture, I found this online at Meg Kamrick, who's the president of the Journalism and Women's Symposium, and she used this to show a picture of President Obama and his advising staff looking to see when we had caught Osama bin Laden. Now, this next picture is how it aired in a, um, uh, an Orthodox uh, Jewish newspaper in Brooklyn. Hillary Clinton has been erased from the narrative. Wow. <laughs> so, how are we to be able to use our voices if we can't see ourselves? And how can we be all that we can be when we don't even see ourselves reflected in the media? 
So I'd like to have you listen to a little video from Gina Davis who runs the cjane.org institute which is collecting data on women and girls in media. I don't know how in the 21st century we can possibly justify not showing girls things that they can aspire to. And at the same time, how can we possibly be showing boys this narrow vision of what women are and what they can be? 80% of the media consumed worldwide is made in the United States, so we are to a great extent responsible for exporting this negative image of women and girls. It's the one area of gender disparity that we can fix overnight. We can't snap our fingers and now Congress is half women, no matter what, it's gonna take a while. But in the next movie somebody makes, they can say, hey, wait, let's make some of the scientists women. Let's make 40% of the police force women and not talk about that they're women. Because no matter how much we tell them, boys and girls are equal and you can do whatever you want, if they're not seeing it, it's not sinking in as well. It's kind of working. There's movies that are coming out now that we've been directly credited with bringing that to their attention. So I'm really excited. I think for the first time since the 40s, the needle might actually move within the next few years. Some even better news than that, someone has actually quantitatively come up with the solution to gender parity in media. Would you like to know what it is? Yeah. Okay. Well, if every screenwriter and television writer would write five women's speaking roles in every script and movie that made the top 100, we would reach gender parity in television and film in four years. Four years five speaking roles to women and hopefully we've got LGBTQAI women, we have women with disabilities, we have women of all ages, we have gender non-conforming. In four years we can do this. Can we make a commitment to go out and talk to all our writers to put in all of the things that we write, women's roles? Yes or yes? Yes. yes. Excellent. Now, right now, many of the stories that we see coming out of the U.S. are written by 62.7% American white males. So American white males are telling women who to be, how to be, and who they are in the world. But women and girls need to be heard. Now I've been giving you a lot of data. And data seems to be what fuels fundraising and organizations. But data doesn't actually change stories. Data doesn't change heart and minds. And in fact, George Lakoff, who's the director of the Center for Neural Mind and Society at UC Berkeley, says that data, that when you present someone who has a story about reality, when you present them with your facts, with your data, they actually get a dopamine hit <laughs> for defending their misinformation and for attacking your facts and your data. So the key is stories. We have to tell our stories. And one of the things I want to share with you is why it's so hard to tell our stories. We are silenced and our being silenced and our being abused is normalized. It begins in our homes. It carries out onto our streets, into our schools, in our churches, in our athletic associations, and in our workplaces. So if we can't even tell our stories, no one can hear our stories, and we can't change hearts and minds. But I have a solution for that as well. Do you want to hear it? Yes or yes? yes. <laughs> so I have had the privilege of spending time with Jess Ladd, who founded Project Callisto, and Lisa Galopter of Techitable, and they have something called Information Expos. So my call to action for you is to go back to your homes and your communities and to ask your communities, your governments, your schools to import information escrows like Project Callisto and Techitable, and there's a whole list of other ones that are being used around the country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanya. It turns out that writers are not the only ones that are predominantly 
American white men in our global storytelling. So um, my next guest recognized this problem in the world of Hollywood film directing. And over 21 years ago, Jennifer Warren founded the Alliance of Women Directors as an antidote. Yesterday, we presented her with the Heart Ambassador Lifetime Achievement Award for this extraordinary work she has done to elevate the status and storytelling of women. And she asked me to begin her talk with a short film clip that really illustrates and drives home this message that Tanya just started the conversation with, that it is so important to see our diverse selves represented and reflected back to us in our media. Here we go here. Read your letter first. Read the letter first. Read the letter first. There's a letter in there. You don't love it. Open it up and read it. What's it say? Dear Emma's doll. Dear Emma's... What? You, you, you got to be kidding me. No! <laughs> off to this company, a set of prosthetics, and so they said after she arrived, they um, she was given a room to stay while her new leg was being made. She was fitted with a leg in her favorite color pink and started walking on it right away. After a few weeks of training to walk and run in her new prosthetic, she is ready to go home and live her life without limitations with you. <laughs> May say the people. Tell Thank you. Tell them to the people. Thank you for making us all like me. <laughs> oh. As you see, the enormous power of a role model. That girl had never seen anybody who had the same problem as she did. And it affected her so, so deeply. We understand now how important role models are. Role models are hugely important in helping women across the world. Uh, they have found out that 90% of the women worldwide find that role models of women are important and influential in improving their own lives. And, and they also found that one in nine women found enough courage by watching positive role models on film and television to leave abusive relationships. However, if only 7% of our stories are being told by women and 93% being told by men, how many of those positive role models can we see? Um, there are many fictional um, role models put up there. For instance, in film and television, uh, if you noticed, uh, they say that women hold 25% uh, of the jobs worldwide. It, actually, it's 40% of women in the workforce. There are a lot of uh, falsehoods and a lot of realities left out. I remember when I was young and growing up in the 50s and 60s, I uh, my father had died when I was 11, and when I looked at television, only I saw were happy families, um, complete families, and there was no family with a mother bringing up a single child, and, and it, it was distressing. Um, that's some of the reasons why I started the Alliance of Women Directors 21 years ago. 
it's the first 18 years that are the hardest thing. <laughs> um, when over half the population, 52% of the population is female, but only 7% of the storytellers are women, there's a disparity that is distressing too. Another anomaly is found in commercials. As you, most of you know, uh, women hold the purse strings in many cases. Uh, they say that 86% uh, of the purchasing power is in the hands of women. Um, however, um, when women are depicted, it is only um, a third of the women that are seen in commercials. That's odd. I don't know how why that would be. And, and if they talk, it's less. It's 20% of the duration of the commercial. Um, how can these figures have not changed in the past 12 years? Uh, some of the reasons are because women are not in, in high enough places in the companies that present our media. Uh, another one is social dominance. When they get there, they seem to want to uh, maintain the power structure and maintain the social hierarchy. Um, I remember when uh, the employment of women producers uh, went up in the 90s and early 2000s uh, from about 13% to close to 30%. The amount of women directors at 7% did not budge. So we need more women, so it's 50-50 also in the boardroom. So how can we change these numbers? Um, use the Bechdel test when you uh, are deciding what film to see. That means, does that film have at least two women in it? And do they talk to each other about something other than a man? <laughs> You'll be amazed at how few <laughs> pass that test. <laughs> Start doing it. You'll be amazed. Um, now, uh, that's, that's one way. Uh, they also found that films that passed the Bechtel test uh, ended up er earning more. And women-led films, uh, as opposed to the general myth, um, have... have earned more, 60% more money than male-led films. Now, there's a myth in Hollywood that this is not so, but in actuality, uh, both uh, female and um, black-led films are also uh, doing well as opposed to the Hollywood myth. Um, um, another thing. How can we change these things uh, beyond the, the boardroom? We can change them with you. You have actual powers to influence the uh, powers that be in Hollywood because it's the ticket holder that, that is, the, is the power that be. It's money, once again, that speaks. So if you not only choose the films that are directed by women, but you also... Uh, have some other ideas. This is a uh, part of the website of Alliance of Women Directors. That's uh, Alliance of Women Directors dot com. Um, you have many calls for action there. Uh, this year, there's been uh, a lot of uh, talk in the workplace about uh, sexual harassment, about sexual assault, and yet the uh, consumer has been relatively quiet. Um, I want you to not be quiet. I want you to speak out because you hold the force. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. So in spite of the fact that 21 years ago, Jennifer Warren created the Alliance of Women Directors and showed Hollywood that there were a large pool of profound women with great talent to hire from, Systemic discrimination against the hiring of women directors in Hollywood continued to be so pervasive that a group of directors brought the issue 
to the American Civil Liberties Union, who in turn brought it to the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. Here to tell that story, oh, also a recipient <laughs> of our Lifetime Achievement Award for her work, not just the work of the American Civil Liberties Union, is Lenora Lapidus. Thank you for joining us. Here we are. Hi. Uh, so as you just heard from Tanya and Jennifer, the statistics, you can go ahead. The statistics for uh, women directors of film and television are terrible. And here are a few more statistics. Of the directors for the top 100 movies per year, during the decade between 2007 and 2017, only 43 were women, four of whom were black and three of whom were Asian or Asian American. Next. Looking beyond directors, last year women comprised only 18% of all directors, writers, producers, editors, and cinematographers on the top 250 movies. And the situation in television is not much better. Last year, only 21% of directors for episodic television were women. So given these depressing numbers, it's no surprise that women directors in Hollywood have been growing frustrated. In 2013, as Sheva mentioned, several directors approached the ACLU at, they approached our office in LA and asked if there was something that we could do to help. They told us heartbreaking stories of experiences they had had. They reported being told, we don't hire women, or we tried hiring a woman once. Another reported that she was told in a meeting that a particular showrunner doesn't hire women. One director said that producers and studio executives repeatedly told her agent not to send women for consideration for particular jobs. And another director was told by a network executive to avoid a show that was not, quote, woman friendly. The studios steer and pigeonhole women to particular types of projects and exclude them from others based on gender stereotypes. There's a widespread perception in Hollywood that women are better suited to projects that are, quote, women-oriented, such as romantic comedies. Women directors are often limited to particular genres and excluded from the more profitable market segments, such as action, horror, and superhero genres, on the ground that these genres, quote, may not appeal to them. One working director told us, when it comes to who's hiring, I think it starts with, quote, we just feel more confident that the guys are going to be able to do this stuff. Well, I happen to be doing an episode that's all about cars. They thought guys would know more about cars, but I happen to know a lot about cars. There are these biases that you hear about and you feel. I know half a dozen women directors that are great with action and love it like I do, but they think you won't be in there and get that testosterone feel or won't be able to hit the male marketplace. Another working director told us, you have meetings about potential projects where studio executives say things like, well, it's hard to have you direct it because it's such a big budget film. You don't have the experience. Instead of seeing that I've done five feature films, but a guy can be hired off of one feature film that's low budget. Women are ghettoized into doing these smaller films, and then people think that's all we want to do. An Oscar-nominated director told us, after my, film won, after my film won multiple awards at the South by Southwest Film Festival, one reviewer said essentially, this is the kind of movie that gets a director every studio knocking on her door. But the truth was, studios were not knocking. I was going into meetings, somehow I ended up for two years interviewing for things and not getting them, or being attached to something that didn't end up going into production. After hearing all of these horrible stories from over 50 women directors, 
we decided we would approach the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So in May 2015, we wrote a 15-page letter to the EEOC detailing the statistics and the stories we had uncovered, as well as the legal basis for finding that the systemic failure to hire women directors constitutes sex discrimination in violation of Title VII. We requested that the EEOC investigate the widespread exclusion of women from employment as directors for film and television, and they did. We provided them with the names and contact information of directors and others in the industry who were willing to be interviewed, and for the past two and a half years, the EEOC has been investigating, and last spring, we heard that the EEOC was in negotiations with the major studios in Hollywood to address the problem. We believe those negotiations are still ongoing and we're hopeful that they will reach a good result. I'm optimistic that things are finally beginning to improve. We've seen the enormous success of Wonder Woman and now with Time's Up, women in Hollywood are pushing for massive changes, not only to end sexual harassment, but to address the power imbalance that has allowed sexual harassment to flourish for decades. To remedy that power imbalance, it is critical that women be hired into the most powerful positions in the industry, as directors, producers, and writers, as senior management at studios and talent agencies, and for all the quote, below the line positions on crews. Only through such change and in the people running Hollywood will we begin to see better representation of women on the screen in films and television shows that, def that depict women's real lives. So it's critical that all of you, as you've been urged thus far, all of you who are consumers of film and television, vote with your pocketbook. Go to movies directed and written by women. Go on the opening weekend when the numbers are being counted the most and watch television shows with women showrunners and directors, like the new Jessica Jones series, which just opened and has 13 shows, every one of which is directed by a woman. So go out and do that and encourage your friends and family and social media contacts to do the same. And if you want to learn more, you can check out the ACLU's website We've got a blog series right now on dismantling sexual harassment. And I also posted an article that, that I had published about um, Hollywood and women directors. Thanks. Yes, and a reminder that you can also write to support at herdambassadors.com and we'll provide you with this PowerPoint and all of the resources in it. So it turns out that when we are not giving women a voice and diverse voices a space to speak in our media, it has many unintended consequences that we don't consider. Our next speaker is addressing directly how not allowing women to be the storytellers as directors, as writers in Hollywood has had the surprising impact of a global nursing shortage. Uh, I am so pleased and privileged to welcome Dr. Mary Sue Heileman from UCLA. A, a, she works in the UCLA Nursing School of Nursing and is also a media producer herself. Welcome, Mary Sue. Okay. I think you're going to speak from there. I am. Okay, great. There are more than 20 million nurses in the world, the largest healthcare provider group globally, and the majority of nurses are women. According to the World Health Organization, we will have a shortage of 9 million nurses worldwide by 2030. We are experiencing a higher demand for more nurses and therefore need people to choose nursing as a career. But traditionally, nursing has been called women's work and judged accordingly. This might be why there's a persistent lack of allocation of resources that nurses need to be effective. Nursing is intensive clinical work, so resources for education are needed to attract and maintain an effective and healthy workforce. But nursing only gets a fraction of what it could get in funding. Nursing involves rewarding work, but often long hours, low pay, and lack of recognition. And this is not attractive to most young people choosing a career. Next. 
The image of nursing portrayed in media doesn't help us recruit or keep nurses. Mostly created for Western movies and TV shows, nursing images go on to be consumed worldwide, but tend to rely on stereotypes of nurses. So nurse researchers from many countries, as shown here, have done studies on how media stereotypes of nurses have gotten into the public psyche, affecting recruitment, resource allocation, burnout, and turnover. UCLA, next slide. UCLA film scholar Kathleen McHugh noted that media has depicted nurses in many, many ways, but seldom in relation to what they actually do. This is not helping the problem. On one hand, next slide. Throughout Western history, nurses have been depicted as angels, assuming they're just good people who are destined to sacrifice without reward, who don't mind the danger or the cost to themselves or their families. But these assumptions undermine nurses. They erase the reality that as nurses, we have to go to college to gain a science-based education, licenses and certification, that we have valuable clinical skills, and we're worthy of a salary and leadership positions. Next slide. On the other hand, nurses have been depicted as the stuff of sexual fantasy, from pinups to postcards to romance novels to cartoons. Nurses have been portrayed as sexual playthings who are ready and available on demand. Not surprisingly, advertisers have focused on the bodies of female nurses. On television, female nurse characters have supplied partners for leading male characters, eye candy, or plot additives. But what does that teach the public about nursing? A notorious stereotype is that of the battle axe, the rigid, vindictive, controlling, rule-based nurse who is often mean and sometimes absolutely evil. Some noteworthy exceptions include Call the Midwife on the BBC and The Night Nurse on Jessica Jones on Netflix. But many situation comedies make fun of nurses. And then there's Grey's Anatomy, a world where nurses seemingly do not exist. Here, all the valuable work that an RN would do in reality, all the clinical work and all the communication that nurses actually have with their patients 24-7, all that one-on-one -on -one time, is depicted by the physician characters. They do all the work of the MD and the RN. Nurses have virtually no role in this fictitious world. Showtime's Nurse Jackie centered on a middle-class white nurse character for seven award-winning seasons. But in addition to being a nurse, she was also dishonest, addicted to narcotics, unfaithful to her spouse, and ultimately was arrested. McHugh suggests Nurse Jackie actually took its lead from The Sopranos to create a drama that was edgy and featured a sociopathic character who was also depicted as a clinical nurse in order to create interesting television. But did it help attract new recruits to nursing? Today, I'm calling for an increase in the accuracy of nurse character portrayals. We need media makers to create realistic nurse characters without making them criminals, harlots, villains, or one-dimensional angels. The characters don't need to be perfect, but they do need to be real. The goal here is to create desirable programming, but simultaneously deepen the audience's understanding of the real work of nurses. Truthaboutnursing.com offers in-depth analyses of nurse de depictions and portrays many ways to take action. As consumers of media, I encourage you to make your voice heard. Join with Executive Director Sandy Summers at the Truth About Nursing, sign her petitions, or contact the Alliance of Women Directors. Speak out on these hurtful mis misrepresentations. Media makers need to hear our distaste for their sensation-seeking drive to intentionally create nurse monsters for the public to consume. An example is the young nurse Ratchet. It's a prequel that's currently slated for production at Netflix. And as you can see from the quote, she will ultimately become the severe manipulative tyrant who terrorizes her patients. How is that going to help anyone? <laughs> Next slide. Mary Sue, just a quick check. It says on your slide, truthaboutnursing.org, and you said .com. It's .com. We will confirm that yes. email. <laughs> okay. Convinced by, okay, the next slide. So convinced by this myself, and aware of the stigma around mental health care, I decided to take my own advice. 
As a nurse researcher, I wanted a way to reach women to enhance mental health and resilience. I knew that stories would be a compelling tool, but I wanted women to be able to engage privately, like on their cell phones. Transmedia offered this. Here, a digital story extends from a TV episode or a webisode to an interactive web page featuring video logs from characters of the story or resource links to services and health information, all accessible on a private smartphone mm. using the internet. Ultimately, my team created the Transmedia pilot project, Catalina Confronting My Emotion, targeting Latino women with untreated depression and anxiety and featuring a nurse character. But first, I had a lot to learn from folks like the team who created C'est La Vie, which just finished its second season on TV in French-speaking West Africa. It features nurse and midwife characters in a soap opera-style transmedia show and entertains, while educating, viewers about maternal child health, family planning, and gender issues. Our Catalina project was informed by the voices of dozens and dozens of Latinas from my own research who literally said to me, Mary Sue, please use my story to reach other women. Our testing showed that Latinas themselves found our lead character, Catalina, to be highly relatable to their lives and they, relate, they rated the nurse therapist character, Veronica, to be trustworthy and real, scoring a 10 out of 10. By teaming up with a crew of Latino media makers and actors in LA, we engaged in multiple phases of development, followed by waves of testing. We collaborated with Latinas of the target group therapists and Latina research consultants in order to create relatable characters. Now, Catalina is just an example of, of transmedia, and it's a way that could be leveraged by women all over the world, collaborating in, with the stories of real women to create productions that meet the needs of women. And effective portrayals of nurses can help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Sue. We actually screened Catalina Confronting My Emotions yesterday. It's a very amazing piece of work. The presentation of nurses in media is really just one example of gender misrepresentation that is pervasive throughout media. Do men and boys also need health care? Yes. yes. So, yes or yes. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to quote you. So, the misrepresentation of women and girls in media costs our whole society. But it also has a profound cost on men and boys. Because when boys are trained through media to see women and girls as sexual objects, and to suppress their own femininity and not being allowed to express their emotionality. Given, in other words, a picture of toxic masculinity to model. The stats are staggering. Suicide is now the third highest cause of death for teenage boys. This is devastating our whole society, not just women and girls. The misrepresentation of us all is an issue that my dear, dear friend, colleague, and partner, Christina Escobar, from the Representation Project, has taken head on and heart on. I want to thank you all so much for being here today. And, you know, we've heard a lot about what's happening with the media and who's telling the stories. And one of the things we talk a lot about at the Representation Project is culture. And for so much of our culture, the media is the message and the messenger. We get so many of our ideas about how to be in the world, about how to interact, how to be a parent, how to be a lover, how to be a friend from the media we watch. We get ideas about what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man and what it means to be a gender non-conforming person, what it means to be a member of a certain racial group, what it means to have ability or not, what it means to inhabit all of these identities. Um, but unfortunately, as my colleagues so eloquently illustrated, so much of those ideas that we're getting and those cues, those social cues, those cultural cues, are told from just one point of view. Um, and it's... <coughs> a male point of view, it's a white point of view, it's a heterosexual point of view, and there's nothing wrong with having that identity, it's just so overrepresented. And as Sheva mentioned as well earlier, America media 
is exported to the world. 80% of media that is consumed is created here in the United States. And as we have learned so recently, for some of us with this Me Too and Time's Up moment, there's something toxic going on in Hollywood. Um, and in fact, a recent uh, poll in USA Today found that 94% of women working in entertainment had experienced sexual harassment. That's almost everyone. That's how rampant it is. And this is the industry that is creating our culture, that is exporting the lowest common denominator to the world. We have to change this culture. The good side is <laughs> that human beings create culture, and so we have the ability to change it. We can change media, we can change who tells stories. And I'm urging each of us in this room to pledge to do so. You don't have to be a Hollywood executive, you don't have to be the one making the decision about who gets to direct what film or what writers get hired. We all have power. We have power to create culture and to influence what media gets created. So I want to talk about three types of power that we all have. We have relational power, which is sometimes the hardest one to use, which is changing how we interact with each other. We can hold ourselves accountable to a higher standard, and when we see something going on that isn't right, um, we can call it out. We can say, ourselves, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And we can ask for the people that we love and care about and know to be better as well. We have citizen power. I mean, look at us here gathered together because of the UN. We are part of an amazing global community, and we should use our power and our privilege that has brought us here today to continue to force change. Um, and then lastly, we all have consumer power. We've heard some talk about that. And I want to say that as consumers, we control so much, we only have to seize the reins. We're living in this new world where social media has laid bare the landscape and made it so much easier for us to talk back to companies. Now, companies really care about what their online reputations are, and a few negative tweets can snowball into something big and major and create real, real change. And so I want to look at a test case for how we've done that at the Representation Project, which is our Ask For More campaign. Um, one of the things that we did was we were saying, you know, we know the media sends women, and all of us really, the message, the limiting message, that where a woman's value lies is in her youth, her beauty, and her sexuality. And that's really bad for all of us. It's bad for women and girls striving to become leaders and make change and be full humans. And it's bad for men and boys and gender non-conforming folks who need to interact with women and girls and see us as more than objects. And so we said, where are the places where we're getting that message and how can we disrupt them? And one of the ones that we saw was on the red carpet. Our founder, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, was a filmmaker and she'd had the privilege of walking the red carpet. And even in that moment of extreme privilege where you know, you're in some ways supposed to be this hype of success, she still felt like a piece of meat because there it was that no matter what she had accomplished, what mattered was what she looked like. And so what we decided to do was organize and say we are more than our dresses. We are the consumers of this red carpet media and it's not acceptable. We wanna hear about more than what the women look like. We wanna hear about what they've accomplished, what their dreams are, what makes their hearts pound. Mm -hmm. And so we organized. We talked to our friends who are just like us and had social media accounts. We, contacted some famous folks and see if they would join us, and we were able to create a real change, a sea change, where the conversation on the red carpet is so drastically different today. And that, that win, that cultural change, has meant the drumbeat of sexist, limiting, toxic messaging is less. And that's what we're working on every day. And I have a short video to show, to, so you can see what that looks like. Hashtag 
ask her more. This is a movement to, you know, say we're more than just our dresses. It's great. The dresses are beautiful. We love the artists that make all these clothes, but it's hard being a woman in Hollywood or in any industry. So it's exciting for me to get to talk to other nominees about all the hard work they did. I will say I enjoy being asked about my craft, my profession. Fashion is something that I think of as an, an extracurricular interest. It's wonderful to celebrate fashion, but at the same time it's wonderful to celebrate the work, so it's not all just about the dress. She suffered from depression. How did you find the balance in this role? I was watching or listening to something where they actually they compared you and your work to Meryl Streep. What's your reaction to something like that? I'd love to know what you're working on now. What's next? Have you heard from families who are saying, hey, thank you? Any advice for your husband? The Ask Her More um, hashtag is trending where they're saying, talk to women about more than fashion. Talk to them about their charities, their movies, their work. What do you think of that? I think it's really important. I mean, I've tried to be, you know, an activist. All of us have. It's great to kind of highlight the fact that women are multifaceted, that we can talk about the world as much as we can talk about our gowns. Yeah, so we won, right? her more and we're going to continue to keep pushing and organizing our community and going out to folks and groups like this to keep asking for more. Um, one of the things that we've been really privileged to work on is the next iteration of the Ask For More campaign which is our Ask More Of Him. And so the Ask More Of Him campaign is about challenging men to speak up on these issues and so I just want to end with a call to action, which is to ask each of you to pledge to use your voice, to use your relational power, your consumer power, and your citizen power. And one of the ways that you can do that is by visiting the representationproject.org, signing this pledge, and what you'll get is a weekly email to something specific you can do that week to help move the needle on gender equality. Thank you. One of the things that's arisen um, as a result of this pervasive suppression of women's authentic voice in media are grassroots multimedia platforms to give women a voice. And one of those platforms we'd like to give a special nod to today, the Global Women's Empowerment Network, who are here filming and live streaming this entire panel. Oh, yeah. So. We have a quick video to play for you about Gwen. Global Women's Empowerment Network shines a spotlight on individuals and organizations that are making a difference in the world. It's your voice, your choice. How are you going to change the world? Crossing the bridge of cultural divide, we stand together and rise. We are taking action for those who are in need of empowerment and education. And we are finding ways to create sustainable revenue streams for global entrepreneurs. Gwen offers a safe place to share your story so that when we reveal, we heal. Collaborating with empowered women from all over the world. Future generations are right around the corner, so we need to come together. Join Gwen and co-create a global community of unity. It's time for Gwen to rise. Join Gwen now. Tori is the founder of the Global Women's Empowerment Network, behind the camera today, instead of in front of it. Yes. And we have another woman here, and her husband, who also represent one of these grassroots organizations. The SHIFT Network was uh, founded by 
Our next panelist, David Haley Mitchell, and her husband, Stephen Dynan, who is also behind the camera today. Um, and she, through the Shift Network, has created a women's summit for the last seven years called Inspiring Women with Soul. Thank you. All right, great to see so many faces from so many places here today. So we've been talking a lot about representations of women in the media, and we've been talking a lot about Hollywood, and just started to hear about other women's voices. But I'm imagining that many of you in the room might be aware of other content, more grassroots content that you think should be getting out there far and wide. And some of you are perhaps even creating your own. For how many of you is that true? You're creating your own content and, or you're aware of content that really uplifts women and you're excited about that content and you want to see it getting out there. Okay, so some of you. And what many of us find is that distribution is the key. So how do we, if we're creating this media, this alternative media, how do we get it out there far and wide? How many of you would really like to see that happen? Grassroots media getting out there beyond just what the big players in Hollywood are putting out. So that's what I want to talk about to you. And how many of you would be interested in finding out about a method that we've used at Shift Network, which is really low budget, low tech, um, doesn't use the big players like Instagram and YouTube, and yet we still uh, have been able to reach 125,000 women from 160 countries. How many of you would be interested to learn about how to do that? Okay, great. So I'm going to tell you. So, <laughs> So as I said, for the, for the last seven years, we've been able to get our messages out. We do interviews with women that are inspiring and that are filled with soul and heart. And we've been getting that out through a very different kind of method. And before I go into the method, I want to make sure that you know that first and foremost, it's about creating good content, amazing content, content that speaks to the heart and great stories. We've been talking about that a lot through this conference and here today. But as we start talking about distribution, that's where we've been doing something that's a little bit different. What we've been finding at Shift Network has really been working for us, and I think can possibly work for you as well, is about using networks of trust for media distribution. Networks of trust. You each have a community of people who trust you. In fact, there's people in this room who hopefully can become a part of your network of trust. We're going to give you an opportunity to hopefully talk with some others in just a moment. But what we found is the most effective way, more effective than social media, more effective than newsletters, is actually just using these networks of trust to get content out. And the way that we do that is through email, which again, for depending on where you live, here that's not the most sophisticated strategy. But, but it works, and why it works is because the people who are sending out emails, so we do a conference, we ask each of the speakers to promote our conference to their list and to give it that personal touch and that personal endorsement. And the reason this works is because we are all flooded nowadays. There is so much media, and we are looking for people that we trust to basically curate that content for us, to let us know what do we need to pay attention to, Many of us have shifted to even starting to look for news coming from Facebook. What's being highlighted by our friends? What are people caring about that we trust? And so you can do the same thing, whether you are someone who uses network and has a large network like we do at Shift Network, or whether you're someone that meets other people at community meetings or even uses a phone tree. But using these networks of trust is really fundamental. Now, what we do in addition to... Um, just asking our speakers to spend, send out things is we try to level the playing field. So those that have big networks, we ask them to maybe send one email. People who are not as well known, we ask them to send more emails. And then if we can, everyone is also often interested in uh, the, what's the financial incentive. So we share um, the revenues of any of the sales we make from the, the recordings of these beautiful seminars that we do with whoever provided, whoever brought the audience. So that's another extra incentive. If you can look at ways to win financially together with your networks of trust, people start really paying attention. Okay, so now I want to give you an opportunity to expand your own network of trust. How many of you have had the experience that some of the most valuable things that have happened at a conference have not been what's happening from the podium, but it's the people you meet? 
and it's the people you meet over coffee or it's the people you meet but you don't often have enough chances to really connect with those people and find your tribe. How many people have that experience? Okay, I know I always find that to be the most valuable thing. So you probably have someone sitting near you who right now can be part of your network of trust. So I'm going to invite you to turn to the, someone that you don't know who's sitting near you. Turn to that person and in this moment say to them your name, your organization, What's your interest in this topic? And then two key things. What do you have? Maybe you have great content. Maybe you have an audience. What do you have to share? And then secondly, what do you need? And you're going to have to do this very quickly. So this is a lesson in precision. This is not the whole story of everything. Lesson in precision and then exchange contact information if you can with the person sitting next to you. So you have about two and a half minutes to do this. Take a minute each and go for it with someone sitting near you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dana. So this issue of having a trusted person with whom to share your story was critically important in our next panelist, and I'm going to do my best to introduce her without crying, because she's a personal hero of mine. I was privileged to present Rachel Den Hollander yesterday with our Social Justice Heart Ambassador Award for her work in spearheading the case against Larry Nassar, the Olympic gymnastics doctor, on behalf of hundreds of other women in the world. Quite a short, <laughs> especially in heels. I'm going to shift a little bit and be looking at uh, the presence of women in journalism and how that impacts the culture of abuse. And as I do that, I'm going to tell you my story uh, and how women in journalism impacted uh, the ability to stop what is, uh, who is arguably one of the worst uh, pedophiles in U.S. history. 18 years ago, in the year 2000, almost on this exact date, I was lying on an exam room table being treated for back pain by a doctor that I was told was the best doctor in the world for a gymnast to see. He was the doctor for our Olympic team gymnasts, the doctor of one of the best gyms in my home state, and a renowned physician and teaching professor at one of our biggest universities. Everyone trusted him. He was the best in the world. And yet something was terribly wrong. What I did not know at the time was that this world-famous physician was a serial pedophile and a sexual abuser and I had just become his next victim. Over the course of the next year, he molested me between 10 and 13 times, finally crossing a line that I knew was nothing but sexual assault. But at 15, the fear and confusion and absolute hopelessness were overwhelming. What could I, as a 15-year-old, possibly do against a world-famous physician? What could I possibly do against the two very powerful institutions that backed him? Around a year later, when I began to tell my mother what had happened, she said, shouldn't we report this? We need to go to the police. And at that point, neither of us really knew the depth of his abuse. But I did know one thing. I knew I wasn't his only victim. He was brazen and rehearsed. Excuse me. His manipulation was perfected. And I also knew that every pedophile is reported multiple times before he is caught. So the fact that this doctor had made it to me after being in a position of power for years and had not been caught for years after seeing me meant only one thing, that the women who were reporting him were being silenced. That one voice was never going to be enough. And so I turned to my mom and I said, it won't be enough. I cannot do this without media coverage. We have to have the press involved. Mm. Press coverage would be the only way to reach other victims so that a pattern of predatory behavior could be established. Press coverage would be the only way to apply enough public pressure to force the institutions and the people surrounding this abuser to take the reports of abuse seriously. One voice speaking quietly and anonymously would never be able to do it. And I knew that if I reported him and I was not successful, he would be empowered to continue. And that to me was worse than waiting. So I waited for 15 years. And I watched for any sign that I would be believed or that this man's defenses were weakening. 
And finally, on August 12th of 2016, while I was cleaning my kitchen, thank you, with my teething baby strapped to my back, a news article popped up in my news feed that changed everything. A female reporter at the Indy Star had gotten a tip about sexual abuse of gymnastics coaches and how the United States Association of Gymnastics had been systematically burying reports against these coaches. She had followed the tip, and along with her two other reporters, they had launched an investigation into USAG and published their findings. The spotlight was finally on USAG, and that meant that for the first time, there was hope that someone might also believe their doctor was a pedophile. I contacted Indy Star immediately and told them about Larry and that I would do whatever it took if they could make the truth come out. And they listened. For the first time in my life, someone listened. Within a month's time, I had filed a police report, filed a Title IX report, and recorded a detailed interview with Indy Star. A second gymnast came forward anonymously to the Indy Star as well, and their investigative report with my interview and her story came out two weeks later. Within hours, other survivors were calling the tip line. And for the first time in 16 years, we weren't alone. It wasn't just my voice anymore. At first, my abuser was so confident that he offered to do press interviews himself to explain away what I had said was sexual assault. He was confident, and he had very good reason to be. Because over the next year, we discovered that, in fact, he had been reported many, many times, and no one had listened. Teachers, psychologists, counselors, investigators, coaches, and even police officers had dismissed the quiet claims of Larry's sexual assault victims for decades. In fact, he had been reported four times by four separate women before I even walked in his door. But the more interviews I did, the more the survivors began to come forward, and the public pressure grew and swelled into a tidal wave that he could not contain. 37,000 images of child pornography were found on his computers, computers no investigator had ever bothered to look at any of the times before. This past January, he was sentenced not just for his possession of child pornography, but for sexual assault against myself and nine other women in two separate counties, though his victims likely number in the thousands. At his sentencing hearing, 256 women came forward to speak against him, some of them as young as 15 years old. They shone a light on sexual assault. Their statements were broadcast around the world. For the first time, putting names and faces and the reality of sexual assault into public consciousness in ways that it had never before been done because of the press. One of the most prolific known pedophiles in history was stopped forever, and the institutions that surrounded him face investigation like never before because of the press. Sweeping legislative form is taking place at the state and federal levels, and we are having difficult conversations that we should have had decades ago because of the press. But there are some very critical lessons that we need to learn from what has happened. The first is the importance of the press. None of this would have been possible had the press not been involved. But the other thing we need to understand is that which stories get priority and how they are told have a dramatic and direct impact on the culture of abuse and in motivating the public to understand and stand against sexual abuse. And this is where we see a great disparity. One of the broadest studies on sexual assault in relation to the gender of the reporters found that male reporters are far less likely to quote women. Only 28% of the quotes are from women when the men report, whereas women quote at almost an equal rate, 42 to 38% respectively. Female journalists are also far more likely to include data and information on rape culture, rape prevalence, and the impact of sororities and fraternities, 48% to 35%. And perhaps most tellingly, female journalists were more likely to include information about the impact of sexual assault on the victim when compared to male journalists. Nearly a quarter of female sources quoted in articles on sexual assault spoke about the impact assault of assault, while near 10% of male sources did. And this is one of the greatest disparities we see in the public understanding of sexual assault. In fact, if you review the Google search trends from my case versus the Jerry Sandusky case, you will see that we did not reach a level of public interest and outcry until 256 women had come forward and put a name and a face on sexual assault. So what do we need to do? 
media outlets need to prioritize the reporting uh, and the hiring of female journalists. And we as consumers need to use our consumer power to support those outlets that do, to engage with content uh, and to comment on content and share content where the reporting is well done. Because as we have seen over and over again, knowledge is power. And journalists are directly responsible for that knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. I actually used social media to reach out to Rachel. I just Facebook Messenger, and that's how we connected. And when I spoke with her legal team about having her speak on this panel and receive our award yesterday, we had a very interesting conversation about the fact that the majority of media producers, news producers who've been interested in the story, have been women. But you have to realize then the women's media, um, women's media center, which was founded by um, by Jane Fonda and Gloria Steinem, catalogs women in media, and they have a, a, an infographic that shows that in 2017, 75% of newscasters were still men. So the stories that get told depends very much on who's telling them. Could Larry Nasser have been stopped 20 years ago? Mm. These are compelling questions we have to look at. It is also important to realize, as Rachel so eloquently said and lived, he would not have been stopped if the media was not a trusted network that listened to Rachel and the subsequent hundreds of other women that were affected. And what we have to acknowledge, or we would be remiss at this panel, is that all over the world, there are women and girls who, because of their gender, simply not only cannot get the attention of news media, but if they try, it's life-threatening. Addressing that issue directly, I am so pleased to present our final panelist this afternoon, Amy Williams, the founder and chair of Global Girl Media. <laughs> Wow, that was quite a, a talk to follow. Um, I guess I'm supposed to be the... Um, it's okay, I'm the finale. I'm going to be hard on the... Yeah, to lighten it up a bit. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I was supposed to come up here and talk to you a bit about my organization, but I'd rather talk to you about what's really been on my mind lately. Uh, and I'd like to start with the first slide. Um, how many of you remember Pack Woman? <laughs> Uh, that gives you a way about how old I am, but, um, you know, I really believe that not only do we have a crisis in gender parity in all media, but we really have a crisis in journalism, um, where social media is just dominating our lives and is quite literally like pack women swallowing our journalism. And it's not just the news it's swallowing, it's swallowing how we bank, how we shop, how we cook, how we date. Don't get me started on online dating and how that's a space for oppression of women. But that's a whole other talk. Uh, <laughs> um, so I really think it's important uh, to think about not only how we tell our story, but who are the gatekeepers of our story and who determines how it gets read, heard, and shared. Like, so here's the news, but only if Facebook and the Google YouTube dynasties determine that it's upworthy of your attention. I call them dynasties for a reason. So there's also an interesting thing going on in terms of fake news where the blurring of fact and fiction is no longer that important to us. And where text messaging, how we use emojis, Snapchat, Twitter, these are all, if you think about it, really revolutionizing the way you interact with yourself, with your friends, with your family, and with your public. So are we kidding ourselves when we think that the internet is really a democratized space that celebrates diversity or a diversity of opinion? So as technology is sort of becoming more and more a part of our lives, as we get so excited, those of us in, this, uh, in the film world, about AI and VR, um, and it's kind of taking over how we think you know, we're going to have the next best story because we're going to use all this new technology. 
I think we really need to slow down a bit and take a look at how this is structuring our future as women. Um, or as a Gawker writer put it recently, nowadays it's not important if a story is real. The only thing that really matters is whether people click on it. Oh. Would you click for me? <laughs> <laughs> I like to call this the tyranny of the click. Mm -hmm. And we're all subject to it. So just think about if these architects who are very powerful of our digital world, those very concentrated news and media companies were creating content that enriched our lives versus catering to our most basic instincts for swipes and clicks. What would that world look like? So I know we're all worried about patriarchal media institutions and male-dominated narratives and lack of women's voices behind the camera, in front of the camera, but I'd like to take that worry a little deeper and challenge you to think a little broader. When the media and its message is presumably owned by all of us, but in reality it's only a very few platforms that allow us to share our message, there's a far greater concentration of power going on. And that's given way to a kind of centralization of information inside a select few networks. And that end result is making us all less powerful in relation to how we can hold our government and our corporations accountable. Dot, 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 the last presidential elections. <laughs> These have very real consequences, of course, for women and girls that literally silence our voices in ways that we can't even begin to realize. So we've already talked about this very real connection between this silencing and the way in which the self-censoring of women and girls go on in social media and how this is also directly related to the kind of violence I'm not hearing a lot of talk about, online violence. I'd like to share a quote from the founder of Twitter, Evan Williams. I thought once everybody could speak freely and exchange information and ideas, the world is automatically going to be a better place. I was wrong about that. So this is really where I'd like to ask how many of us in this room are not from the United States? And how many are living in the United States and originated from another country? Um, I think that this question of access and the Me Too culture and the standards that we set for ourselves here in this country are very different in places like, and I just want you to slide, slide through these, refugee camps, informal communities, places, this is Kibera, this is Shatila in Beirut, refugee camp where there's no electricity, or maybe it's not affordable. This is a, a whole community that lives off this dump in Kenya. Rural communities, where you have to walk miles and miles to get to the nearest internet cafe, and in Morocco, if you're a girl, you're not allowed inside those cafes. So women and girls are most affected. This is a, a young woman I took a photo of on the streets of Gaziantep, Turkey, last year. She hadn't been to school in three years. She's a Syrian refugee. I doubt she's been online in those three years. So these are a few statistics. 25% fewer women than men have access to the internet. It goes up to 45% in sub-Saharan Africa, 35% in Southeast Asia and the Middle East. I'm going to add another one that's not up there that I just read this morning. 1.7 million women in low-income communities do not even own mobile phones. And then down to 40% of women don't use the internet, cited lack of comfort with the technology. So we're, we're talking about a pretty deep digital gender divide which exacerbates the economic divide. And what I'd like to talk about now is the issue of privacy and safety. The leveling of the information landscape has also unleashed new torrents of vitriolic racism, sexism, slut shaming, and new means of shaming and harassment, basically taking it off the streets onto the internet. It's an atmosphere that has proved particularly hostile to women of color, and women living in non-secular societies dominated by extremism, places like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, revealing that the inequalities of the physical world are reproduced all too easily in online spaces. Again, who's most at risk? Women and girls in developing countries. Also, you have to understand that in these countries, most of these phones are owned by the husband or the brother or the father, 
and uh, they dominate those phones. They'll take them and they'll look at the text. They'll um, uh, basically survey the girl or the wife. And you can just imagine what that feels like to be uh, controlled through your cell phone day in and day out. So it's not just a question about authorship of this media and gender parity, but it's about access and it's about privacy and what that means for women who may be risking their lives by taking their story public. How much time do I have? Oh, I'm out. Okay, so I really, really want to share with you this last video. Do I, can I do this? Is the, can we just end? Because it's, these are teenage girls that really want to speak to you from around the world. How many of you want to see it? Yes. <laughs> Actually, they're going to kick us out of the room. So if you want to see this, can you email it to them? Yes. Uh, it's two minutes long. Show half of it. Because we're online, only 24% of news stories are about women. Because when I go online, I want to be empowered. Because 77% of producers are men. Because girls use the internet more often than anyone else. I want women's voices to be highlighted just as much as men. Because on social media, sharing should not mean comparing. Girls as young as six are starting to see themselves as sex objects. Because I'm tired of seeing the Kardashians in the news. Because I'm tired of seeing videos of how to put on makeup when you're drunk. Because I want to be intellectually challenged. Because hearing from women heals the world. I want to see stories that have women of color, women with different body types. Because women need to be taken seriously. Because it's not news if it's only told by 50% of the population. Because keeping us silent keeps us oppressed. Because girls' voices matter. Resist. Restore. Reshape. What I love about what just happened is you all took the call. You became responsible consumers. And you told us what you want. And what you want is you want to hear from girls. So I honor you for that. And we do have one final video to show you. The girls in Amy's video were calling out to see positive, inspirational female role models in their media. And I have been working on a piece of media to honor the positive, inspirational female role models I met at my first commission on the status of women five years ago. Before I play it for you, in summary of all that has happened here this afternoon, I want to acknowledge something. As we're moving toward the end here, I, there's no way that I can tie all that was brought forward in this panel with a pretty bow, because the situation, as you hear, isn't pretty. We have a big gap to fill. We can't deny that the current status of women and girls in media and their access to it is devastating. And yet, as the curator of this panel, growing and learning from these incredible women at my side and more, something emerged for me that looks like a bit of a recipe. And I saw it in Rachel's story, and I saw it in the directors and the ACLU and the EEOC. And I see it in this video that I'm about to play for you. The ingredients of this recipe look like this. One woman raises her voice into the listening of a trusted network. That trusted network tells her true story in a responsible way. And that empowers other women to raise their voices similarly. And when they link arm in arm, 
seeing each other's story, an army is formed. Together, then linking arm in arm with law enforcement policymakers, justice is brought and social change is created that elevates the status of women. Retelling this complete story in media, as we have done today, further enrolls others in their power, as you just demonstrated, to change culture and move the dial toward a culture of gender equity and a global culture of peace, and making this a world that truly works better for all. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to the big sisters of Iceland. Human trafficking. The problem is so vast, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime has suggested that human trafficking is now set to outpace both the drugs and arms trade as the largest illicit industry in the world. We need a solution that's bigger than the problem. Law enforcement, government agencies, and non-governmental organizations by themselves are not big enough to solve this problem. What we need is a civilian army bigger than the army of buyers. The statistics of horrors create despair. Until you meet Gudrun Jonsatir from Iceland. Gudrun stepped onto the UN stage and yelled, Enough! In Iceland, we just don't sit around whining about all these things. We get off the couch and do something. In Iceland, they fought for 10 years to pass the laws, which decriminalized the prostituted person and criminalized the buyer and the seller. On the day the law passed, the Icelandic women gathered for a champagne toast, their favorite thing to do. Simultaneously on national television, the Icelandic police chief announced, this is the stupidest law I've ever heard. I don't have the staff, the resources. Forget it. Over the champagne, the Icelandic women once again said, Enough! We've tried to play by the rules. Now we're going to take matters into our own hands. Operation Big Sister was born. These sisters decided if sellers can buy anonymous phones and place ads in the paper and online, why can't we? So they placed decoy ads, and within an hour of placing their first ad, they received over 300 phone calls. They'd answer the phone, Big Sister is watching you, or Here's the address, and they'd send them to the police chief's house for services. He began to destabilize the sex trade in Iceland. When men called to buy sex, they didn't know whether they would get their mother, wife, sister, or girlfriend on the phone. The big sisters invited all the buyers to a press conference, telling them that it was about hot models from Eastern Europe. They all wore neon burkas to protect their anonymity and perpetuate their power. And with the media following them, they marched to the police chief's office and handed him a list of 144 names, phone numbers, and email addresses of buyers of sex. One week later, the Icelandic government assigned 25 million krona to create a special police task force for ending human trafficking in Iceland. Multiple buyers and their first traffickers of prostitution were arrested and prosecuted. In addition to their neon burkas, the Big Sisters developed another part of their clothing line, I Am Responsible Underwear for Men, which the police chief proudly wears on the outside of his police uniform. Individuals that care when we come together change the world. We would like to offer you an Operation Big Sister Champagne Toast and an invitation to join our civilian army. Please visit OperationBigSister.com and go to our Take Action page to learn how you, with no personal risk and very little time, energy, and money, can contribute to the efforts to uplift the dignity of every human being and end what President Jimmy Carter calls the greatest human rights violation in the history of humankind. Thank you for being a big sister or big brother.
So this short video premiered yesterday at the Women Illuminated Film Festival, which I am proud to have co-founded with my colleague Christina Escobar and Tess Cacciatore to give more women in media a voice. But if I could leave you with only one thing today, it is this. You don't need to launch a film festival or host a UN panel to be a content distributor. Each of you is a content distributor. Through the media you choose to consume and demand from us, through the conversations you have and the things you say to one another, and what you speak and type into your devices. But perhaps most important of all, through the quality of listening you bring. Because you can be that trusted network that might just be the space that allows the next person's voice to rise up and change this into a world that works better for all. Thank you for choosing this as your media today. Thank you to our panelists for being the voices that are changing the world.